Production of American Graduate is funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through the National Center for Media Engagement. More than one million students drop out of high school every year. If the trend continues, it will cost the nation more than $3 trillion in lost wages, productivity, and taxes over the next 10 years. Closer to home, dropouts from the class of 2008 will cost Ohio almost $9.8 billion in lost wages over their lifetimes. They're staggering figures. In May, CPB, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, launched a national initiative to help stop this damaging trend and improve high school graduation rates. WOSU is proud to be a part of this initiative to try to find answers to important questions like, what are we doing in Central Ohio to support student graduation? Where can we expand our efforts? Where can we do better? And how do we sustain our successes? We have five people on our panel who are trying to solve this problem. They come at it from different directions. Dr. James Moore is a professor of counseling education at Ohio State University and the co-director of the AT&T Success Centers. The centers help high-risk ninth graders at Columbus's Lyndon McKinley High School and South High School. Attorney Fred Rancier III heads the advisory committee of the Near East Side Redevelopment Partnership, which is working to revitalize the neighborhood surrounding University Hospital East. Steve Vota is the executive director of Learn for Life Columbus, which addresses non-academic barriers to student success. Barbara Seamer is a founder of the Seamer Institute for Family Stability. The institute helps families at risk of homelessness stay in their homes and thus keep their kids in their current schools. And last but not least, Keith Bell is the deputy superintendent and the chief academic officer of Columbus City Schools. Keith, we'll, we'll start with you. The Columbus City Schools graduation rate uh, stands at 78%. Central Ohio districts seem to be doing better than the statewide average, which is 74%. What is the current trend right now as far as graduation rates and the dropout rate here in Central Ohio? Well, I can speak to uh, Columbus City Schools and what we've been doing in Columbus City Schools. And what we've tried to do is to uh, examine some of the non-academic barriers and some of the challenges that we face uh, every day with our students. You know, our students come with a, a lot of uh, uh, issues that uh, affect graduation, but we've been very, very uh, fortunate in improving our graduation rate from 55% uh, 10 years ago to you know 78% now. So there are a lot of things that have happened that have been right, but um, we're continuing to look at and examining different ways of being able to to get our students to keep them engaged. Uh, I think the the big thing is that we have uh, narrowed our scope as far as our initiatives. We uh, have priority measures that uh, really. Um, help us to, to focus on literacy as a component of, of graduation and looking at that throughout the entire district. So um, making sure that we've got our, uh, all of our initiatives aligned to being able to help students to be successful. And uh, you know, this was my first year in the district. Matter of fact, uh, next week will be a year. And when I came into the district, it was obvious to me that a lot of work had been done, uh, a lot of good work by a lot of good people. Uh, in the district because to raise the graduation rate in an urban setting with all of the challenges that we have uh, to the point that we are now is significant. So we're going to continue to do that. Uh, we're looking at changing some of the things that we're doing to, to get past it, but we're going to continue to work hard to, to make those, the, those gains. This is not a shared problem. 30% uh, of the state's dropouts come from just 30 high schools, at least according to a 2009 study, and those schools are in urban districts predominantly. Dr. Moore, uh, your organization works at two inner city high schools in Columbus. Why are these kids at higher risk of dropping out? Certainly, uh, as, um, as my colleague indicated, there are a number of factors that young people face in, in our larger urban centers. Um, uh, and a lot of it is not just unique to the schools and the kids, it has a lot to do with what is going on in our country. Uh, uh, as William Jules Wilson has eloquently articulated about when work disappears, uh, the family breaks down, the community breaks down, and all of those breakdowns, there is a rippling effect that occurs in the schools. Uh, students bring, I mean, we're, uh, one thing about people that when you have issues and challenges that you endure in your community and your homes, we don't leave those issues and challenges at the door. We bring them with us except now schools are being expected to not only address those issues, but they're expected to achieve 
um, the high academic standards that are mandated by the state and also mandated by the federal government. Um, one of the things that we're noticing with our young people in these settings is that um, oftentimes the schools, many of our urban schools, they tend to be the most under-resourced. And so with the kids with the highest need, they need more rather than less. And one of the big issues in, this, in, in, our, in our beloved Ohio is that we haven't righted some of the wrongs with funding in our public schools across the, country, across the state. And you, you talk about the economic situation in Ohio, you saw the line pretty much going steadily up until about 2008, mm -hmm. when the recession hit and it dropped back down again. And hopefully it's, it's leveling off and we'll go back up to that. Because I think back in 2008, it was up around 86% was the graduation rate. It dropped, now it's dropped down to 74. Obviously the economy has to be the big driver there. Steve. Uh, I think you're, you're right. If you look at today, the percentage of kids in the state of Ohio who are on free and reduced lunch versus what it was five, six years ago, it's amazing. Today, I think in the state of Ohio, 44% of the kids who attend public school are on free and reduced lunch. And that's enormous. I mean, just, I think it was like six, seven years ago, it was around 30, 33%. So you can see how the economy has affected children today. And when you think of the entire state, that's a very phenomenal number. Fred Rancier in Ohio, African-Americans African -Americans have a 46% graduation rate. Hispanics, a 43% <clears throat> graduation rate. Why the racial gap? I, I, find, I find this very, a very interesting uh, fact in that the issue of dropout seems to be clearly focused on our minority populations. Uh, and uh, I'm not as clear as to what the strategy is to address that. And I think uh, as we look through time, this is not new. Uh, this has been around for more than a century, and we have not adequately uh, addressed these, these issues. What, what comes with minority status is disadvantage in income and health care and, and a whole array of social services. And, and uh, it's, it's the fact that, that we're asking school systems to address these issues seems to me to be even focused on, on the, the wrong path. That we're gonna be, the schools are going to be looked to to feed children, to transport children, to do these things that are outside of the academic mission of the, uh, uh, of the uh, public institutions and uh, education institutions. So, uh, you know, this, this is just an issue we have failed to address in our society and, and uh, the, it's, it, it shows pretty clearly. So is the solution lifting up the economic status of minorities? What is the solution? What, what is, how should we address this? This is integrating, this is integrating our minorities into our society. Mm -hmm. uh, from, from my view of, of life, I'm not just looking at education, I'm also looking at the consequences. So who's, where's the largest population? Who, who is the largest population of uh, prisoners? Uh, it's, it should it be a surprise that the, those who are failing in our education system are part of our correction system. Uh, it, it, the, the, the parallels, the, the, the uh, issues that have created these phenomena are, are ones we don't like talking about. These are not issues that are easy to talk about, uh, but until such time as uh, that we're, they're willing to uh, discuss these openly and, and uh, uh, seek to address them, I, I, the, these statistics, are, the issue of high school dropouts has, has not changed in 30 years or more. I, these are the experts. They can, they can probably put a, a dot on that. Right, and I'd like to, just, uh, to, to expand on the, when you look at the um, uh, community and you look at, at what could take a student out of, uh, of school, if we don't grab them and do what we need to do with them and they look at the, this, uh, the, the world that they live in, then we have to, we have to give them the um, engagement. We've got to connect them to the point where they want to be in school. And sometimes what, what happens is uh, we don't differentiate to the point where we make it specific for them so that they can actually see that they can be successful. And if a student doesn't, th doesn't even think that they can be successful, then at any time the community can grab them. You know, I, I look at, uh, I was raised in Toledo and I, I look at in, in that uh, environment. And the reason why we were able to, to get out of that is our parents made it very clear to us 
that education was the way out. And if that's not something that is articulated in the, in the uh, community, if it's only articulated in school and they go back and it's not articulated to where they live and we have them for seven hours and, and they're in a, a community for the rest of that time, it isn't repeated, it makes it very difficult. So I think you know, it's important for us to, to look at, at making that um, something that is, is attainable for our students and being able to let them see that they can be successful and then celebrating that when they, when they become successful. And, and that's one of the things that we try to do in Columbus, make sure that kids know that. And I think that has uh, helped us to be able to increase our graduation rate. Mm -hmm. Barbara, I want to look to one more factor, mobility. It's, it's kids changing schools often because of their parents moving. And this happens particularly in low-income households, they're in the constant search for more affordable housing or, or affordable housing. You, your, and your organization tries to help people stay in one home. What effect does changing schools? We've tried to, cons to uniformly map out curriculum. In theory, all schools are teaching the same way, but it's still a factor. It's a huge factor, and it's one of the most underreported, understudied issues it's very hard to find any data, and, and we're cautioned on statistics, so I won't go too heavily into it. But just to give you a few, a child who moves three times in his elementary years, between one and sixth grade, will probably have lost a year of education. That's scary, because we have 40 and 50, and even in Columbus Public Schools, some schools have up to an 80% mobility rate. The second statistic is more direct to what you're talking about. A student who moves in the high school years between 8th grade and 12th grade will lose, will drop in graduation probability 50%. I find that statistic very hard to believe, but that's what the doctors and the professors write. So I guess I'm forced to believe it. Mobility changes the schools, it changes the students, it changes the students in schools even when they aren't moving because the school is mobile. It's one of these things that we simply, because there are so many different factors that affect mobility, we don't know quite how to address it. So we are attempting at least to try for those families that we can to keep them in the home because one family in a home is probably three kids in the same school. We hope that's going to make a difference. In addition to the change of school and having to catch up with a subject that maybe you might be a little bit behind on or the rest of the classes, you've, you've ripped the student away from his support system or her support system, the friends, teachers they may have built a relationship with, these sort of intangible things that, that keep kids in school. Just exactly. And so the teacher has a hard time as students are constantly rolling in and out of a classroom to develop a relationship with the new students who are coming in. It's not just bringing them up to speed on proficiency tests. It's developing that personal relationship of someone the kids can trust, um, that they can talk to. The children feel very alienated. And I think that's why in high school when kids move, it's, we all know it's a terrible time to move kids around because all of their friends, um, their social group has changed and the groups that may accept them may not be the groups that you want them to belong to. So um, that kind of stability for kids is critical in, in their social well-being and their academic well-being. Even Very under the best circumstances, if a student stays in one school, the student is in school six, seven hours a day. They're in school 184 days a year. What happens the rest of the time, Steve? I mean, <laughs> that has to play a huge role, if not the key role, in, in keeping kids in school and helping them graduate. Well, certainly, because when they leave school, um, if you look again at the data, most kids tend to get in trouble in those hours between three and eight. Um, that's when lots of times they go home. If they're in a single parent situation, it's not unusual that mother is working. Um, it's kids watching kids. Um, it's a challenge. Um, you know, if you look at some of the neighborhoods, it's not the same kind of neighborhoods a day that it was when we grew up. And so um, there's lots of times not the opportunity out there. You can't go out to the park and play basketball uh, quite the same way as you did years ago. So um, there seems to be, you know, obviously there's a lot of crime in the community. You know, those things make a difference with kids. And kids want to feel safe. Um, they definitely want to feel safe and so it, it's important to have those kind of opportunities where kids can go and get involved in community-wide activities, church groups, um, after-school programs, athletic programs. Um, those extracurricular activities are just critical for kids after the school day. I assume the parent 
mom, dad, even grandparent in some cases, is the key person to preventing dropout. Am I wrong there? Um, if, the, if the parent is, is around, if they're available. You know, I, I think they're a, a key player, but I also think we all are key players. I think uh, the teachers are a key player. I think that uh, all our, us community residents are key players. I think the after school staff are key players. Um, you know, it really takes everybody to wrap their, those services around kids to prevent the dropout. It, it, there is no one single answer or one single person. Um, we do know that relationships are critical with kids. The key to success is that child having a positive relationship with another adult. Can I just add something? Sure. What Steve said I think is really important. You can't, we can't make this happen without collaboration today. It's very, very difficult for schools to do it by themselves, uh, for parents in some cases to do it by themselves. It has to be a collaborative effort. And I think, you know, you go back to old school, that's the way it used to be. I mean, you had neighborhoods and you had people um, that, were, that cared about other people's children and, and took uh, ownership in that. And I think that model, uh, when we look at it, when we look at what we need to do with children today, with all of what they come to school with, it's very difficult for a school to do that by themselves. You know, we try to do the best that we can, but you know, having the, the um, support, the external support, uh, being able to uh, repeat the same things and be able to get them to be consistent about the things that they're getting that are positive is, is a key element. And, you know, no longer can we look at it as a, as a standalone, just send them to school and think the school is going to be able to do that. It just won't happen. And so we have to continue to, to work together. But that collaborative um, uh, methodology and looking at how we work together is going to be essential to moving kids forward. Are we asked, go ahead, Barbara, are we asking parents to do too much or? Well, unfortunately, we may be asking them to do too much, but I think the truth of the matter is they probably aren't doing enough. One of the hardest things that we've learned in working with kids in schools and parents is that they think if they get the kid up, dressed, maybe fed, and off to school, their job is done. And it is just the barest part of their job. There is so much more that has to happen after school. There are books that need to be all around the living room. There are places to study that need to be quiet and orderly. Um, there should be library cards where everyone's going to the library on a weekly basis, and there should be reading going on um, together or individually. This is the parent's responsibility. When you have a parent that is overburdened with all the other chores and work and um, is trying to do laundry and cook and clean and do everything else, that time to work with three children, perhaps, is just not there. And so the kids end up doing what kids do. They goof around or watch TV or um, play text on their iPhones. Um, that's what they're doing, but they aren't doing the homework. The family, the home environment is absolutely critical. It is the biggest single influence on these kids. And, and the parent is the first educator a student sees. And so, you know, parent, I tell parents that all the time. I mean, you're, you're the first educator, and it makes it, and I agree, it's, it's very, very important. And the after-school tutor mm -hmm. throughout a career. James. Well, well certainly uh, uh, family plays a critical role, in, um, and I'm reluctant to say parents because, you know, that's very uh, elusive in many communities because sometimes grandparents are functioning as, as parents. However, uh, I travel all around the country and, and doing work on this topic. Uh, parent, when we talk about how to do it right and how to do it wrong, I frequently ask um, when I'm doing talks, how many in the audience have actually took a parenting class? And that's whether you come from a fluent community or whether or not you come from a working class, working poor community. Let's ask it here. And mm -hmm. How many in our audience have, have taken a parenting class? Mm -hmm. Wow. So it's more than normal, and I could have. <laughs> yeah, it's more than normal, and I and I, I have been. Quarter of the yeah. Upper audience, yeah. yeah, and I have been in a room with more than 600, 700 people in the room, and I would say it's more in this room than in the actual room, whether they had an education or not. And so what I'm saying in our society, we leave parenting up for chance. Some do it right, some do it wrong. We demonize the ones who do it wrong. We celebrate the ones who so happily, you can even look in suburban neighborhoods. And I live in the second most affluent community in the United States. And I know parents who, not, who don't do it right and they have professional degrees. So what we have to do in this society, I think we need to have a campaign. If library cards are very important, we need to articulate that. 
However, working poor, working class families engage school systems in the educational process very differently, particularly in the African American community. It's not that they don't value education, it's not that they're not engaged, they look at the people who are the experts. For example, if I ask in here, how many in here would diagnose themselves uh, if, they if they thought they had cancer? They wouldn't. They may have symptoms, they may read about it, but they're gonna go to a physician and depend on their expertise. Well, working poor, working class communities look at educators in the same way. Honey, Miss so-and-so know more about education than I do. You do whatever he or she says to do. Uh, and unfortunately, many of our educators are not fitting the bill with these young people. They're falling short. Now, it, it would occur to me just by observation uh, that the, 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 the problems we're talking about in their urban-centric uh, issues, uh, but they are the issues of urban America. And so where does society's role fit in adjusting to the changes that are taking place in the household? The, the single parent, uh, the, the two working parents, that's, that's going to be, an, that if it's not the norm, it certainly will be the norm. Where is society's role in making these adjustments? It seems to me, just by observation, that we're removing resources. We're not adding resources uh, to, uh, to address what is occurring today. We would like to change it back to the way it used to be, but it's not gonna happen that way. <laughs> it will never be the way it used to be. Well, I'd like to, before we get to the what can we do to try to solve this problem, just a couple more questions on what exists. What are the warning signs that a child is at risk of leaving early? Well, well certainly the research suggests that we can figure out as early as third grade whether or not a kid is going to even finish high school how, with how three variables. Mm -hmm. If a kid goes to a school that's highly populated with minorities, if they go to a school that is highly uh, populated with free and reduced lunch, and if they're reading below one grade level, we can predict with 90% accuracy that they won't graduate from high school. And in places like, if you heard the whole notion, the mantra that went through the Children's Defense the Fund about the school to prison pipeline, some of our, our states, our neighboring states, I won't call out their names, they determine how many prisons they're gonna build based on those variables. So we give up on a young baby at third grade. We don't think we can solve this young child's problems in nine years. We give up on them as a, in our country, our beloved country. Exactly. And so we can, we can figure it out really early. The warning signs are very early. Uh, and we can also, with health care, you know, the achievement gap and some of the issues begin in the mother's womb with health care. And this health care issue is bigger than what people can think about it, is that some people, some moms are not providing health care at an early stage. And then not only the housing piece, you know, the other issues, cycle development skills, Many of our urban and rural places, they live in homes that are filled with lead and asbestos that we know affect psychomotor skills and IQ. Yeah, you know, just to piggyback on a couple of things that you said, I think, you know, when I look at what we do in Columbus City Schools, and I know, you know, when you look at the national research, what, what happens, but, you know, we've been able to do some really positive things in the same time that our graduation rate uh, increased from 55% to, to almost 78% we reduced our dropout rate from 45% to 22%. So that trend of having been, and it's a high, you know, high poverty school district, um, we have some educators who, who are getting it, who are working hard, who are getting after it. So I wanna um, emphasize that, that there are people that are working very, very hard. I think one of the things that happens is understanding some of those challenges. That might not be something that's a, that's a um, uh, that you don't learn that in your universities and colleges. You know, you come in and you get, you're get you in situations that you may not necessarily be prepared for, and we're working to, to be able to do that. But I do know in our school district, uh, the improvement that we've been able to make uh, with keeping kids in school and to reducing that dropout rate is, is because we have people that are understanding some of the components that you just described, uh, understand that kids are going, going to come with some of this baggage and that we have to not use that as an excuse, that we have to uh, understand that and not let kids use that as an excuse too and be able to, to move them forward and let them know that there's an opportunity for them to, 
to, to have what everybody else has. And I think, you know, um, we've got to continue to, to, to carry that flag. Truancy, um, absences is a, key, is a key warning sign. Basically, it's an early sign that the student is becoming disengaged mm -hmm. from school, does not see how what he or she is learning in the classroom relates to his or her life, correct? Absolutely. I, I can't emphasize and agree with James Moore. Um, you go into a prison population, 40% of the prisons have people that are not literate. They are literate at a fifth grade level or less. Um, it's no surprise that they have ended up in prison if they are unable to read even at a fifth grade level. Um, we, we simply have to do an earlier intervention. We talk about high school graduation. The truth of the matter is it starts at age two and we are having so many students who have not been prepared to learn, who start kindergarten, and kindergarten isn't play school as it used to be. Kindergarten is real learning right now. It's like first grade used to be, right? It right. is exactly, and we have kids who are coming in three years behind in reading, learning readiness. These poor children have no chance to catch up. There's, if we don't do more than we've always done, we're never going to get a better product than we've always gotten. If we don't start earlier and prepare the kids sooner, it's what Steve's working on um, with Learn for Life. It starts so early. Parents don't want to think they have to start to go to work on their kids at age two, but they do, and that's the truth of it. How do you, how do you make that connection between the classroom and, and real life? How do, you, how do you prevent truancy? Baltimore, they fine the parents $50 a day, if there's even a possible jail penalty if the kid is truant for too many days? I, think you gotta, I just think you have to make school a place where kids want to come. Right. I mean, I, I think that that's a, that's a key component to, to um, you know, them being successful. If it's a place where they can feel that uh, they have a chance to be successful, they have an opportunity to um, uh, explore some things that uh, they, they haven't been able to explore in other areas, I just think that we have to make that that opportunity for them. I, I used to tell my, my teachers all the time, if kids are making mistakes in school, what better place for them to make a mistake? You know, the real world, if they make the same mistake in the real world, they don't really care about them the way we do. So we have an opportunity when they make the mistake in school to teach them. But if we make it so that when they make that mistake that we treat them the way they do in the real world, then, then we're gonna get the result that Barbara has said, the same kind of result. So I just think we have to make that so that it's comfortable for them, challenge them, but at the same time, make it a place where they want to come. And I think, you know, we continue um, through uh, our um, uh, education, making sure that, that we find out what it is that they're interested in, keep them connected, but make it a place where they want to come to. I think you're right, uh, Keith, I completely agree. The other thing that we can't overlook is the influence of peer pressure, it, especially at the junior high age. It is just phenomenal, the impact that it has, because at that point in time, it's all about acceptance. And so lots of times you find kids just almost withdrawing from their peers um, or there's bullying going on and things like that. Some kids just, it's not so much even the teacher sometimes or the school, it's just that they don't have friends or they withdraw socially. Um, and the, the, that's a group of kids as well that um, you just can't overlook. And I think the other thing too, and we talked a little bit about it um, um, before we came out, you know, in the age that we live in now, um, direct, direct communication isn't something that everybody, ha that everybody does. So what happens is uh, students uh, can be in situations where they don't necessarily have to talk to anybody. So if I don't learn how to talk to people, then I have a hard time looking people in the eye. I don't know how to have a conversation with somebody because I can text or I can email or I can, you know, do all these other different kinds of things. And the skill that, that will help me to understand people is being able to have a conversation with somebody. And so what we try to do in, 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 the, in the school system is to, to get them to understand that, yes, these, these other this technology, all of this stuff exists, but it doesn't beat face-to-face -face conversation and being, getting them to learn some of those people skills. And I think that's another reason for, um, as they come to school, making, that, making it a place where they can enjoy uh, learning because they get an opportunity to uh, engage, have that, that social interaction with, with other people. And, and when, you, when you look at uh, um, uh, Thomas Friedman, when he looked at the world is flat, one of the things that he talked about that, that, that really resonated with me is that we need to teach the love for learning. Um, when you look at it, if you can teach kids to understand the love to learn anything, it doesn't make any difference whether it be in school, whether it be, you know, I just learned how to scuba dive. I mean, you know, it doesn't make any difference what it is, <laughs> that you just love to learn. Learn, learn to love something new and, 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 and really look at, at that as the, the essence of, 
of your core, then I think it makes going to school a lot easier. So um, those are the things that I think will help uh, students to, to, uh, to that get them to resonate with, uh, with education and, and stay in school. You know, the love to learn aspect of things. I remember when I w was going away to college and the last thing my father said to me was that, you know, you're not going to college to earn a living, to make money, you're going to college to learn. And the, the, the uh, rewards will, will, will follow. And, and to that point, why, why are these students not in, engaged? Why, why don't they want to come to school to learn? And I think some aspects of that is, the, again, back to the breakdown in the family. We're talking about lower income people and perhaps now mul multiple generations of poverty. Uh, there's no vision as to what education's value is in the context of either learning for life or what it brings for my future. And that's, that, that, that comes to school, that, that's, that's, not, that's before uh, you get a chance to, to uh, create that positive influence. The relationship, you, you talk about <coughs> kids wanting to come to school. The school is an enjoyable place. And that's more than just the fancy classrooms and the computers and the smart boards and the nice entrances. It's the relationship that the student has with their favorite teacher. Can, I, can I ask a question? Sure. If I ask people a question, was there not somebody, anybody out here that didn't have a teacher that infect, uh, impacted them? I mean, that tells you how important teaching and education is and being in that school building really is. So do, are we doing enough to train teachers to build these relationships? It was very difficult today to foster relationships in the way that we live in an era of testing. Um, you know, many of the teachers uh, who are entering the teacher corps, they're not the same profile 30 or 40 years ago. Um, they're sometimes they're not even sure because you know teachers where I'm from from the south they remain teachers 40 50 years I mean they some of my dad's teachers are still teachers <laughs> you know uh, because they saw it as a vocation as a calling rather than a truly career we now socialize teachers don't live in the same communities like they once did many years ago the kids are coming in People, teachers are saying that we're expected to do more, but I'm saying the teacher has always, historically, everything I ever read has always served as the school nurse, as a teacher, as a principal. They always wore multiple hats. But for some reason, we live in an era that not as open to serving those multiple roles like they, like they once did. But I wanted to also reflect on something uh, about high school dropout. At the beginning, we talked about one million students drop out of high school annually. But that doesn't factor in the students who come to school every day who do, who do totally nothing. Mm -hmm. And they come to the school because it's all their friends in schools. But some of the students, when we think about literacy skills, if you can't read and you're in the ninth grade and you're reading at a fifth grade level, we were talking about this in the back, a ninth grade teacher won't say I'm a teacher. A ninth grade teacher said, I'm a ninth grade teacher. So they're not going to teach fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. So these are some big issues that we're finding with our children at an early age. They got academic gaps in their learning. And the ninth grade, when they get to the ninth grade, the teachers say, Well, how did you get here? Oh, I can't do anything with this child. And as a result of that, uh, the students are being um, not properly served. What I refer to as educational malpractice. Uh, how do we let a young person get to that point and don't intervene and you get to the ninth grade? Because we have a lot of the young, and we, particularly with our boys, who are reading multiple grades below. At this, at this point, I'd like to invite members of our audience. If you have a question, do you want to take part in this conversation, please approach the microphone. Go ahead. I just wanted to just to Dr. Moore. One of the things that, uh, and you make, a, you make a great point about a student getting to ninth grade and you're just figuring out that that they, uh, you know, that they haven't gotten the skill set. One of the things that we're doing in Columbus is we have uh, a feeder. We've got th uh, our, our uh, district divided in regions, and we have feeder mm -hmm. schools. And one of the, the rationales behind our feeder schools is to be able to have elementary, high school, middle school teachers talk to each other. 
Um, for example, your best teacher might not necessarily, best high school teacher might be an elementary teacher in a particular subject area. And because of the way we have th had th and things in a traditional setting aligned, they might not ever have a conversation with each other. So what we've done is align those um, feeders together so that teachers can talk to each other. So we can all see in, in elementary a student that is in that feeder, what they might look like as a high school student, what their deficiencies could, could be. Uh, and then how we might systemically address those before they get to ninth grade. So when they get to uh, middle school, we've already got some things in place and looking at how we, how we can do that. So I think that, uh, you know, when I look at, at that um, uh, as, a, as an issue, I think that's one of the things that you have to get that early identification. If you look at uh, ACT data, it'll tell you that if you don't get to students, you know, I know Barbara talked about second grade, I know that's important, third grade, but the data um, that I've looked at talks about in eighth grade, if they're not successful at eighth grade, it's very difficult for them to be successful in high school. So we know that that's important. And so we know that even before that, we've got to get them ready for eighth grade. So we're looking at, at that as our feeders and, and being able to do that. And that's one of the ways that we're trying to address that issue. Our school's too large. We face budget cuts in many districts because of the financial situation the state finds itself in and cities and towns f find themselves in teacher to student ratios are climbing again, high schools. I've seen good teachers take large classrooms and break them down and do uh, positive uh, work. I've seen teachers that had small classrooms that didn't do as good a job as teachers with large classrooms. So I really think, you know, uh, having a smaller classroom it probably is better, but I think, you know, when you have an effective teacher, that's probably even better. The Gates Foundation tried very hard to break high schools into smaller pods um, so that you would have a more of a family supportive um, structured environment and after several years and a lot of money they kind of gave it up because they said it really didn't have any discernible outcome that, that changed the way it had been before so it wasn't the size of a high school um, or even the size of the classes it will always come down to the teacher it will always be that one person in the classroom who is excited about the subject and likes kids and all of that is transmitted to the students. I think the other thing today is that we have much better uh, data within the classroom to utilize to help catch kids up too. I mean if I, you know, some of the data that I've seen on way we can do short cycle assessments and identify what's where this child is behind and, and really try to strategize that and how do we bring this, this student up. If you can do that, it does make a difference. It does, and Project Grad tried to work on that, and I think in, in a good classroom, in a well-functioning school, there are ways to identify the minute a student starts to get behind that you have massive intervention to catch that child up. But that takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and more teachers than we have available. Right now we are having more and more people um, that are taken out of the classroom rather than putting more in. I have a son who's dyslexic. I know exactly what it took to get that kid to get a master's degree. It took a massive amount of time and effort and energy. It's a one-on-one -on -one thing. When you have kids that are dealing with any kind of a learning disability, then there has to be a lot of intervention and we simply have not placed those resources at their disposal. Um, although there is a program in place right now that I'd love to talk about it later, um, where we are trying to intervene at a very early time, early part of the, the elementary school. But um, we, that just, we need the intervention so that we don't allow them to become ninth graders with a fifth grade education. And I have had those kids in my classroom. That absolutely happens. And we haven't even talked about English as a second language in our schools. Jean Harris will tell you that there's 167 languages in Columbus City Schools. That effect of kids moving in um, from different cultures, different languages, that's an enormous drain on the resources of a school. You must deal with those different language requirements, but it's taking resources away from the general mainstream classroom. We have a question from our audience. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Dr. Moore made a very interesting question. He asked the audience how many of us have had a parenting class. Uh, so I'd like you all to react to this. How would you think requiring a parenting class in high school so that every high school student would have to learn how to be a good parent? How would you react to that requirement? Do you think it would help? I'll, I'll weigh in on some of that because I had a daughter who carried around an egg uh, for a week um, uh, and had to nurture the egg. 
it actually did make a very big difference. When I was in high school, you took a what's called problems of living, um, but you did learn about what was involved in being a parent, what was involved in being a citizen in your community. Um, I know that some Planned Parenthood, for example, has a doll that is programmed, and you must be on board with the doll to feed it, change it, um, walk it. Doll might have colic. You walk it all night. Hmm. Believe me, after a week, these kids get what it is to be a parent of an infant. That doesn't mean that they've been taught what it means to be a parent of a three-year-old, six-year-old, 17-year-old. Very different thing. So it's very hard to transmit that to a 17-year-old because they have no idea what they don't know. So it's very difficult to say, oh, it's with the old curse, just you wait and see what your kids do to you, um, because they just don't understand. And in many cases, they aren't in control of themselves. They can't quite stop doing what they're doing. So um, taking a parenting class, you can give a lot of guidelines of, of listening and instructing and doing what I do and not just what I say, but it's a difficult job to teach that class. Well, in some of our charter programs, um, particularly the Harlem Project out of Jeffrey Canada's work, many of those parents have to uh, sign contracts. Uh, the KIPP program, the Knowledge is Power program, mm -hmm. I think we have one in Columbus now. Uh, parents have to agree to do certain things. But, but on some level, in some of our lottery schools, uh, some of our magnet schools across the country because they're uh, in order for your child to be included in the lottery process, you have to sign this contract that you will do X, Y, Z. They'll read during the summertime. They'll read so many books. So uh, some of those things do exist. Naturally, the parents who get it, uh, they naturally are willing to do anything. You, they would do a boot camp if you told them to uh, because they understand the benefits of some of these kinds of things. But I, I think we need. there are ways we haven't even talked about our uh, faith institutions, how the role that they can play in terms of facilitating these processes with our parents. But it's very difficult. We're talking about working poor, working class. We say we want high parental engagement, but I always ask the superintendents when they bring me in, I say, well, when do you have your parent conferences? And they say, we're having them in the evening. I said, are you suggesting, I come from a working class family, my dad worked third shift, so he couldn't have came to your uh, parent conferences, but my mother could. So we got parents who work two jobs. So how are we adapting to today's parent and their needs? And, and the, because when parents begin to look at their hierarchy of needs, they're gonna say, we gotta eat. We need shelter. So in order for me to have those things and meet my hierarchical, Maslow hierarchical needs, I need to work. And so we need to think about how we can be more, uh, to change how we do the day-to-day -day in schools. We've talked about early intervention, starting early, spot kids early, start learning early, have the kids uh, appreciate learning at a very early age. We've, early age. We've talked about engaging parents in ways to do that. We'll look at the curriculum. Um, we mentioned what we're expecting kindergartners to do now. You mentioned the testing culture that we all are a part of now, that students are a part of now. Have we raised the bar too high or have we raised the bar too quickly? And is that leaving some kids behind and causing dropouts? Great question. Yeah. <laughs> is testing a solution or a measurement? Well, it's a, it's a, I think it's a measurement, but I, I don't think we've, um, if I understand your question correctly, I, I, I think that when we look at at where we want kids to be and, and what, they, what they're going to have to, uh, the skill set that they're going to have to have when they graduate from high school to be successful. Um, I think that you know, we're trying to do everything we can to keep those standards as high as we can. I think what we, what we have to be careful of is trying to put our kids and compare them to other countries. Because one of the things I want to tell you, I spent some time in China. Uh, I got a chance to go into a Chinese classroom, saw what, they, you know, what that looks like. And, you know, it was, it was, there was a lot, of, a lot of good things that went on. But one of the things I found out about that is that, that if, you don't, if you have a disability or if you have any kind of a deficiency, you don't get an education in China. And so when you look at trying to compare our students to what happens in other parts of the world, understand that we're not comparing apples to apples, that there are a lot of things that don't occur um, in, in those situations. So I think when we look at 
where we want kids to be. We have to be real careful about how we compare uh, to other situations. So I, I think that what we're trying to do is to um, at least get us ready to be able to get them uh, to understand what it will take for them to be in college. And the thing that happens now is that college and work ready, work, being work ready are one and the same, that they have to have that same skill set to be able to, to compete because the jobs that you know had when I was growing up are no longer there. So, Fred, is testing hurting some kids? I, I'm, I'm not sure what we're testing. I mean, it's, it, in terms of data collection, it's probably important to guide us in our, in our pursuit of excellence or achievement. Um, I think every every child comes with a different set of a different background, different experiences, different life, and I, by by the, the, the testing seems to want to bring everybody into a uniform outcome. And I, I think we get lost in the individual student needs or the individual community needs. Uh, the more emphasis we place on test outcome, uh, it, it, it's 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 necessary. It's important, but it shouldn't. Uh, I think guide necessarily our um, uh, outlook towards the achievement of, a, of, of students. Right, I, I would agree, but I, I think testing overall is good because it, for once we are being more accountable and I think that we're able to then track kids better. I think we're able to adjust our teaching better. I mean, knowledge is power. And so I think there's a lot of good things with testing now. Is it perfect? No. It's not perfect whatsoever, but I think it's on the right direction and we're moving in the right direction. And so I think it's great to have high expectations. It's how we it's, it's when the information we got. It's right, how you use that information that can be a challenge. And I think one of the things that's happening now to answer your question directly, because I, I, I understand what you're saying, there should be multiple measures to be able to determine a student being successful. I think leaving it at just a test by itself. You know, I, I go into classrooms a lot of times and I ask teachers, how do you assess a student other than paper and pencil? What do you do to determine if they're on track with what they're supposed to be doing other than paper and pencil? And I think one of the things that we need, we're looking at, and you, if you look at the uh, Common Core and what, what's on the horizon, you know, looking at the portfolio and looking at uh, uh, having the, the uh, opportunity for students to express their learning in different ways, uh, I think is important. But they, there has to be, uh, an expectation that they get to a, a level of being able to uh, communicate and be able to achieve. And I think that the testing, you know, uh, is a way for us to do it. But in and of itself, I think we need to look at multiple ways of being able to do it. And I think that's you know, on the horizon. And it's, it's one of the things that, that uh, I think will help us to be able to assess students better. Barbara? I think the problem comes when we have teachers who say they are forced to teach to the test. That is not really good teaching. You're teaching to your students and you're responding to what they're needing to learn. Um, that kind of testing does not measure creativity and entrepreneurship and imagination. And I think, was it um, Keith referred to the world is flat and Friedman says, the strength of this country has always been in our creativity, our entrepreneurship, um, the way we have been able to be innovative. And that is probably the biggest measure of success for any individual is their ability to adapt and innovate based on their circumstances. Teaching to a test doesn't do that. It measures what they've learned, but I'm not sure that that is going to be the ultimate measure of success in life if that's the only thing that we're going to measure. And as Keith says, there's a whole lot more that we better be measuring and teaching to and trying to foster than just Okay, yes, I read Beowulf, I read The Scarlet Letter, that's, that's great, I can do um, some geometry and calculus, but there's going to be more, and maybe it's more of this kind of association that's working in collaboration with other kids, with other people. That is something that we still need to be working on too, but if all of our energy and time is devoted to that test so that we get the scores that make our school continually improving rather than um, needing more improvement, then I think we're going to miss the boat in education. Thank you, Barbara. One, I just wanted yeah. to say, I, 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 would, I would say one of the things that, that I uh, look at when you look at testing, they, they don't necessarily have to teach to it, but they have to teach like it. And there's a difference. And I can be creative if I can teach, you know, here's my format, here's what I have to do, this is what it'll look like, but then I can incorporate my creativity into it. So I don't teach to it, I just teach like it. That's, I know what it looks like. A very good teacher will yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. You have a question from our audience? Go ahead, please. I do. I just have a really quick question. 
You know, we talk about mobility and family stability. The goal of that program in some respects too is about classroom stability. I don't know what we're supposed to do with our teachers who are faced, if we were foreman on a line and doing job and we had a new crew every month, which is what's happening in the classroom, we could never make the progress we went what we need to make. How do we stabilize the situation in the actual classroom? N reduce the mobility of those children so that the teachers who are really quite talented can work in an environment where they can actually, I, I know Dr. Moore said that they're, they're being asked to do, that they feel they're being asked to do more. I suspect that what they feel like they're being asked to do more isn't what we think it is, it's about the fact that they're faced with moving parts constantly that we weren't faced with. I went to a school where there were 44 students in class and one nun who stood in front and we all listened. <laughs> but I also know that everybody I went to first grade with, almost all of them were still there when I went to fifth grade. But now we're finding situations where there's a constant turnover and how do the teachers handle that? Should we be teaching them special classes and, and when they're getting their degrees on how to handle those situations in the classroom? You know, I just think one of the things that we, we, we're doing in Columbus is um, trying to be consistent with how uh, and methodology and how it's taught from one place to another. So, for example, I mentioned the feeder system and being consistent and being able to understand where, where students are deficient. If teachers in, in Windsor are teaching like and have the same uh, resources and are able to, to get kids where they need to be in uh, West Broad, then it doesn't make any difference if a student has to transfer from one school to another. We can ensure quality instruction throughout the entire district, and that's the goal. You know, we've got some, some work to do, but that's the goal, and I think one of the ways to address that is in, a, in, in our situation in large urban is to make sure that we are being consistent internally because most of our students when they are when they when they are uh, mobile transfer from one school to another within the same school district Barbara, so that takes care of the curriculum how do you how do you help the relationship building what's an idea to help the student adapt and to make new friends and to form that relationship with the teacher that could keep them in school keep them from leaving early that would take a lot of intervention and i think it would be very helpful in in especially the elementary schools where that move is really scary for small children if there were some way to give them an introduction into the classroom before they actually enter. If there's time, there often isn't time. Oftentimes the, the original school has no idea that the kids are leaving, they don't know where they've gone, and the new school is faced with the child who shows up on Tuesday morning and, and says, I, I need to go into the third grade. And so they are taken down the hall, they go into the third grade, and the teacher gives them a seat and a book, and, and class goes on. That's generally the way it happens, and that's very hard for a child to assimilate um, what's expected of him and how he's going to relate. It helps a lot if one student is assigned to be the mentor, big sister, whatever, and, and in successful schools, I think, usually give the new students someone in the classroom that is their particular buddy for a while, and that makes the transition enormously easier and more productive. So I think there's ways, and again, a sensitive teacher will be very alive to that. Um, teachers get overwhelmed. There's a school in Chicago, 4,000 kids in a high school. There's 1,000 kids who come in every year and 1,000 kids go out every year. When you're asking teachers to deal with this huge influx of kids and the outgo um, in the other direction, the, the population remains stable in numbers. Within a year, 25% of the school is different, and in two years, half the school is different. That they, the statistics tell us that even in, for students who are not mobile, if they're in a highly mobile school, the whole level of the education goes down. It almost has to, to in order the for the teachers to, to, to yeah. bring in these other kids and, and bring them into the classroom. What about the role of career and technical education, vocational schools? certainly a role for career and technical education and I do a lot of work with gifted and edu gifted education the gifted ed folks don't like the career technical folks and vice versa however uh, a recent doctor student at Ohio State University did a study and he looked at students who had a traditional vocational or career technical education those who had a college preparatory and those who had both those who had both made more money over the lifespan because it's applied 
and what uh, many of our students, why, one reason why they don't go into the non-traditional fields like STEM, we're desperately in need of non-traditional populations to go into STEM, is based on interest. You know, it's very abstract. Many of our laboratories, e even our science laboratories, even in our suburban neighborhoods, they're not on par with some uh, where they need to be to get students really engaged. We tend to be high on theory and low on experiential part. And we know regardless of what the kid's background is, they really embrace experiential learning. But in the classroom, that is, that's absent from the classroom today. Um, but I, I'm in favor of a both and rather than an either or, but the discourse and exchange across the nation, it tends to be either or. Dropout recovery programs. The student has dropped out, has left school. Should we give up on them? Never. No. No. I just think you have to give kids alternative ways of being able to um, get that diploma. You know, a couple uh, uh, ways, you know, you look at uh, the flex credit opportunity for students and what that means is students can, can as opposed to getting a, going into a course to, to get the credit, they could actually go into a business and, and actually write their own lesson plan and write their own way of being able to, uh, to, to demonstrate that they've learned. So I think those kinds of opportunities. Uh, I mentioned earlier the um, bombardment with technology. There's some kids that learn better that way. And so you know, looking at you know, different ways you know, that, that, that they learn, I think we have to be, and we are, more adaptive to the different learning styles that kids have uh, and being able to try to do everything we can within the limited resources that we have to be able to try to address some of those, some of those needs. At just the start of the conversation, we've only just touched the, the tip of the iceberg, to use the old cliche, and this forum is the first of continuing discussions on raising graduation rates and preventing school dropouts. We urge you to stay involved, stay engaged, and look for continued programming on WOSU. For our crew here, for our panel, and for our audience at WOSU at COSI, I'm Mike Thompson from WOSU Public Media. Production of American Graduate is funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through the National Center for Media Engagement.